So hello and welcome. Happy Friday. Today's Friday, April the 7th, and this is Backyard Beekeeping Questions and Answers, episode number 203. I'm really glad that you're here spending time with me. I hope you learned something new today. My name is Frederick Dunn, and this is the way to be. So thank you for being here. What's going on outside? Temperatures are soaring 39 degrees Fahrenheit right now. Sunny, and that's 4 degrees Celsius. Right now we have 2.3 knot winds, so not bad, and no threat of rain for the next three days, so that's great news. What else can I tell you about before we get started? Okay, so a lot of you are coming into spring, unless, of course, those of you down in Australia, you're headed for winter, so sorry. But here in the United States, spring is coming, so oftentimes back air beekeepers, we have to keep our bees away from the neighbor swimming pool, bird baths, hummingbird feeders, and things like that. So this is the time of year to start thinking about where you're going to stage your water stations. Water stations for bees are important, and here's one of the big reasons why you want to start right away, even before the bees get out there and flying. Since things aren't freezing anymore, it's not going to turn into a block of ice. Wherever you set up your water station, keep it. Keep that position, because as the bees come out, the new ones that are doing orientation flights and things like that, and forage for water, which, by the way, is a job of your senior most foraging bees. It's the last thing they do before they actually die of uh, hard work and labor. So once you start, uh, try to keep the water shallow, keep the water moving. Static water is a problem for bees. So if we have a, a light uh, flow, so if you just have a garden hose that you put up there and uh, you just crack it a little bit so it just mists onto some surface, concrete blocks, rocks, things like that. Let the water flow over that and then drip down onto the ground, hopefully where you have some fantastic plants that uh, can handle some moisture. Maybe um, swamp milkweed would be good if it gets plenty of sun there. Anyway, wherever you set them up, try to keep it consistent so that your bees will know to go there. And whatever they go to first, they continue to go to because they pass that information on to other bees as they mature in the hive. Let's keep them out of the neighbor's pool so none of those kids with bare feet are stepping on bees. That's when they get stung. What else is going on? Oh yeah, the dry pollen sub-evaluations. It's too late now. State of Pennsylvania anyway. The last day that they visited the dry pollen sub was April 4th. They stopped after that. So what's that mean? They're getting their sub, not sub, they're getting their pollen from the trees and plants right now. So that's the good news. In the face of real pollen, they're not going to touch your dry pollen substitutes. Does that mean you shouldn't put it out? You could, but uh, you're going to see very little traffic. So for those of you who are right now investing your hard-earned money in dry pollen substitute to put it out for your bees to forage, if you find that the bees aren't paying attention to it, it's not because the sub doesn't draw them. It's because they're in competition with real pollen and real pollen wins. So I didn't put out the video yet that showed my studies and they're going to come out soon because I did time-lapse video because video is hard to argue with and this is why it's going to be important that I show you the video. There are several studies out showing honeybees preference for various top brand dry pollen substitute formulas and my bees did not follow those recommendations. So. This is the lineup that my bees showed a preference for, and I don't mean a marginal preference. They overwhelmingly went for Ultra Bee Dry Pollen Sub from Man Lake. Number two, they went after AP23, which stands for Artificial Pollen Formula Number 23, and that comes from Dadon. So that was number two. Number three in the lineup, which should have been number two, number three in the lineup is Mega Bee which uh, you can buy in a lot of places, but it's also sold by Better Bee. So the most popular by far was Ultra B. Now with the scientific studies that I looked at, where the bees showed their preferences, Ultra B wasn't even in the study anymore because they considered it too low on the totem pole as far as what the bees would prefer. But I put it out there anyway. Why? Because I had a 10 pound tub of it because I spent my hard earned money on it. And uh, AP23 was supposed to be number one, but it's number two and so on. So anyway, if you already have your dry pollen sub, you can put it out. If you're thinking about buying it, though, kind of late in the year, I think. If you're way up north somewhere, 
and there's a delay and you know there's going to be quite a while again before the trees and other pollen sources are producing for your bees because our um, willow trees for example are not uh, producing yet so that's still coming up but uh, I think right now for me and this is every year I try to document when the bees first start going for the dry pollen sub and they'll do that in 39 degrees Fahrenheit even though it's that cold if the sun is shining and they know there's a source there they go to it. Right now at these temps, 39 Fahrenheit, full sun, they're out there um, on my Hive Alive syrup, which is just something I'm giving them to boost, whatever. So anyway, um, if that's still ahead of you, if I were investing my money right now and I wanted something, so here's the thing. This is part of the discussion. Let's say AP23 is identified as nutritionally superior. Let's say that. Part of the key there is uh, we need the bees to consume enough of it, haul it back, load it on their bodies, haul it back to the hive, and of course, put it in the cells so that the nurse bees in there can turn that into bee bread and ferment it and feed it to the developing larvae. That's what we want them to do. The most popular fermented stage inside the hive is 48 hours. So 48 hour old pollen or pollen sub inside the hive is when the bees are using it the most. So older stuff does not get used as much and the fresher stuff being brought in does not get used as much as the 48 hour kind of time zone there. So, um, but the thing is we want them to take in a lot of it in a short amount of time. Now this is what's interesting about pollen substitute when you're offering it. And I know I'm I'm putting a lot of information out right now because I have a video coming out, so why retread it? But just in case, um, when they go to dry pollen sub, they're collecting enough pollen in the space of about 10 minutes uh, to fly back and deliver that to the hive. If they're flying flower to flower, tree to tree, and so on, uh, it can take them several hours to do what they can do in just 10 minutes. So that's one of the advantages to dry pollen substitute is providing a protein that they need to develop their brood early in spring ahead of the actual pollen sources in the environment. Now, I'm not saying you have to do it. You don't. This is for those people that want their colonies to really boost up earlier, okay? So to take advantage of just a couple of weeks um, ahead of what the environment will provide, that can help you out. If you don't do it, they're just gonna go with whatever's out there, but sometimes, guess what happens? We end up with the storm series that comes through, rare but true, and it could rain on your area for two weeks in a row, for example, making it unsuitable for the bees to fly out and get their pollen, which they need for brooding, right? So if you take these little windows of opportunity where the sun is shining, where it's not raining, as it was last Saturday, last Saturday in the morning, it was sunny and clear and warm and everything was great. And so I put out dry pollen sub. Let's say you did that too. Bees fly out, they get all the pollen sub that they need right then, they fly it back to their hives as quick as they can. So their production rate is really increased. What happened around noon? The temperature dropped 30 degrees. High winds came up, rains came in. Now, when that happens, of course, they cleared out. They weren't on the pollen sub at all. It was really interesting that before the first couple of raindrops started to hit, they were already clearing out and not touching the dry pollen sub that I put out. So the bees know what's going on. And what I did was I gave them just enough in that short amount of time by putting out dry pollen substitute so they could get back to their hives and have some brood rearing going on, even though they're not going to be able to access the environmental pollen later on, which would take them, remember, hours to do in comparison to dry pollen sub. Dry pollen sub is not a natural way for them to collect pollen. How do they even find it? All I do is put the substitute out. I wonder, they all smell pretty similar. AP23 kind of had the lowest scent that went into the air from what I could smell. The Ultra Bee smells strong. Mega Bee smells pretty strong. So they fly into the downwind of that and they come right to it. I don't have to do anything else to attract them to the dry pollen sub. So that's enough about that. If you wanted to boost them or help them out with heavy weather coming and you got a sunny day, sunny opportunity, put them out. And just as with the water that I mentioned before, try to make sure your location for that is consistent. Where do I put my dry pollen, dry pollen substitute? And I only do it so I could observe it, so I could do that study. 
Um, uh, I put it right next to my holly bushes. I have a whole hedge of holly bushes and uh, I use that as a backdrop. Why? Because I want to take pictures of them and videos. And I want to do backyard citizen science evaluations like the practical test that I did, which was to see which ones they take the most. So that video is coming out. Uh, what else? Do, 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 do. So April 4th for me, that's the last day. So if you're right here in the state of Pennsylvania, your time for dry pollen sub has passed. They are after trees. Uh, what else? Water sources, I already talked about it. So if you want to know what we're going to talk about today, please look down in the video description. All the topics are listed in order. There's also a link for you to click on, which will take you to my website, thewaytobe.org. Click on the page, The Way to Be, fill out the form, and your topic might be considered for next Friday's Q&A. This is also a podcast. So it's on Podbean, The Way to Be. Podbean, The Way to Be. But if you just Google podcast, The Way to Be, it's on iHeartRadio now and a bunch of other stuff. Someone was asking if it could be on the Apple podcast. It is now. So I got picked up by seven different podcast uh, kind of media outlets, right? So if you just Google The Way to Be podcast, see what shows up. Maybe it's something you already have on your phone or whatever, so you can listen. So the first question is from Richard from Sunbury, Pennsylvania. Friend asked me if I could move some of my hives to his fruit orchard, cherries, peaches, and apples. The problem is that the orchard is only 1.3 miles away from my apiary as the bee flies. He would like them to be relocated in about a week, so I don't have time to do a longer distance relocation or move back. Do you think this is too close to just move them directly to the orchard? Appreciate your input. Okay, now. Richard is Pappy Richard. So if you look up the YouTube, he actually posted that YouTube video of him moving his hives. So I gave him a response right away because it sounded like time was of the essence. And uh, he tagged me in the video. So if you want to look up uh, Pappy Richard YouTube channel and see how he moved his hives, see what you think. Was that too far? Uh, so I think that uh, this time of year, the bees uh, are not necessarily, keep in mind, the weather's cool, right? So they're not flying as far. This is why they're going to known resources. So whether that's uh, sugar syrup or something that you're putting out to give them a boost, please make sure you warm that up before you put it out. And if it's dry pollen sub, again, consistency of location is very important. And so I told him uh, 1.3 miles away this time of year, I would just, me personally, this is what I would do. You know, if somebody um, asked me to move bees to their orchard to help them with pollination, uh, I would consider that far enough. I would not do an intermediate uh, change. So I think he's going to be fine moving them 1.3 miles because their foraging range, we know the maximum range, uh, can be around three miles in every direction. So that's a six mile diameter area of coverage. But this time of year, I find that the, the bees aren't going very far and that's because it's too cold and the resource would really have to be convincing for them to um, continue to go that far. You might have one or two scouts heading out going the distance because they're always looking for new resources. But I told Richard to go ahead and move his hives. He also has hives back in his apiary. So any orphaned bees would of course drift into other hives. That's what I told him, that's what I thought. Now another consideration, if you're being asked to put your bees near somebody's orchard or some other area that they really want a lot of pollination for and you're new to that, Try to find out what the prevailing wind direction is in the area where you're going to move your hives. And the reason I say that is twofold. So reasons. Uh, one is you want to keep it downwind of the trees or whatever you're going to have your bees pollinate. And there's two reasons for that. One is the scent from those flowers will come down over the bees wherever you've placed them. So they'll find it quicker. They would eventually find it probably anyway, but they find it quicker when they're downwind. The other thing is it's better to have your bees flying on empty towards the, uh, against the wind towards your nectar source. And then once they load up on pollen and nectar, when they're coming back to the hive, they're coming back with a tailwind, with the wind, which makes it easier for them. So that's just kind of another boost that you can do if you're thinking about positioning and you have the option of where to put your hive. Some uh, orchard growers, some farmers have very specific ideas about where they would like uh, pollinator pallets to be placed and things like that. So then your, your choices are gone. But if you can convince them 
uh, then you could make sure that your pallets of bees are downwind of that. So anyway, I hope that uh, Richard gives us an update on how that went. Uh, I know he already moved them. So that's a shout out for today. It's that uh, YouTube channel. Question number two comes from Mike, Lower Hudson Valley, New York. This is an involved one. This is really big. Sometimes when I see a really huge write-up, I don't have time to read it. So I kind of scoot along. But uh, this one, I read the whole thing. I'm in the lower Hudson Valley of New York, about an hour north of New York City, agricultural zone 6B. Weather has been warming up and bees are flying and bringing in lots of pollen. Counts average 20 to 30 bees with pollen per 60 seconds. Nectar flow has not started yet. I had a question about that. How did you know the nectar flow had not started? Often if they're bringing in pollen, they may be finding nectar in places that we don't know about. So anyway, I have two eight frame Langstroth hives, double deep configurations. During my last inspection, which was the first time I removed brood frames this season, in one of my hives, I found a small area, approximately four to five inches in diameter. And one of the two brood frames that had multiple eggs, sometimes three or four eggs in single cells. Eggs were all on the bottom of the cells. That's key too. So we're going to explain that. I saw the queen during that inspection and she is approximately 20 months old. The small area of multiple eggs in cells was right next to cells that had single eggs, larvae, and areas of capped brood. The other brood frame had cells with single eggs, larvae, and capped brood. The colony is currently only occupying four to five frames. I've considered and consulted local beekeepers and my mentor and it's normal to and it's normal to have a small population in this area this time of year the two frames on the outside on both sides of both deep boxes are full of honey my second hive is around the same population amount and slowly brooding up but does not have multiple eggs in cells i would love to hear your thoughts on this okay first off in my opinion, based on my observations, um, that's not a problem at all. And a couple of the key things that are mentioned here. Okay, so it's not a really young queen because sometimes very young queens, uh, newly mated, tend to park a whole bunch of uh, eggs in the cells. So it's not surprising when a queen starts to do that. I also highly suspect that a queen coming into the laying season, coming into high production, uh, may do something similar, may also have a bunch of eggs. I've seen queens uh, going across the surface of the brood frame, unable to keep her eggs in. In other words, eggs were coming out of the back of the queen while she's walking across the frames before she could even put her abdomen down in the cell to intentionally plant the egg. I don't know what her problem was. I've only seen that in one queen. But it was very interesting and her retinue of bees, those uh, nurse bees that attend to the queen, were removing those eggs as they came out of her. So uh, one of the reasons I'm not really concerned, I also don't think this is a laying worker situation. And remember, we're speaking in generalities. There can always be some really weird exception to a lot of broadly accepted observations and rules about uh, what's going on in brood frames. But uh, the queen bee has the longest abdomen and therefore she can park the eggs all the way in the bottom of the cell. Now, unless these cells are very shallow, which I doubt that they are because it's not new comb, it sounds like, uh, workers that become layers generally park them right on the sidewall. So it's kind of a tell when it's a worker or the queen. I think the fact that there's an active queen in the colony that you did see her laying and that she's there, I think she's the culprit. Just my opinion. But I also think there's no problem with the colony. Because we have a laying, they have brood, even though it's, you know, moderate in size, it is, according to other beekeepers, in keeping with the size of the brood pattern that you would expect this time of year. So, I think we're fine. Now, I already responded uh, to Mike, just uh, so that you wouldn't be wondering until Friday what was going on. Because another thing that we know is going to happen, that by the time uh, those eggs are in there, we know that in less than two weeks they're going to be capped. So nine days from the time the egg is laid, you can see a capping on there. 
So then you're going to see by the shape of the cap on the brood cell, especially if this is worker brood, right? So worker cells, then uh, we know that those caps will be strongly domed if they are in fact drones, because if it's a laying worker, that's all they're going to produce. If the queen is laying those eggs, and you may not see it at the point of being capped or once the larvae hatch. So in other words, the egg hatches on the third day. So once the egg hatches, that's when the nurse bees really get in there. That's when I would expect to see them policing up those cells and making sure that other eggs that are there get removed. So nurse bees do that. Um, what else? The other thing is there has been no case where multiple bees have uh, pupated in a single cell together. So they're going to be filtered out by your bees. So the only question yet to be answered is going to be, and I hope we get a follow-up from Mike, whether those were workers, which I 99.9 .9 suspect that they are, um, worker bees, not laying workers, and whether they're drones. So if they were laying workers, they will be drones, and you'll know that soon enough as well. I vote for workers. What do you vote for based on these observations? Make your opinion known down in the comment section below this video. So Mike, if you're out there, let us know. You may already know by now the next time you can do a brood check. Uh, let us know what's happening in there. Next question, number three comes from John Fredericksburg, Texas. I have several large colonies that I would like to re-queen. Two double deep boxes in most cases. What is the quickest and most effective way to isolate the queen to transplant into a nuke resource hive before adding caged mated queens if I cannot spot her. Okay, that's a pickle. Um, you need to spot the queen, especially if you want to isolate the queen and put her into a nucleus hive uh, prior to receiving a replacement queen in a cage. And uh, I'm just gonna explain what your best opportunity to do that is. You have to find the queen in this circumstance. It's not like a walkaway split where it really wouldn't matter if the queen was part of what you removed or part of what you left behind. You're making a preparation to bring in a queen in a cage that's mated and ready to lay. So we have to know. Now, it depends on how much time you have also, but I highly recommend you find a way to spot that queen. But in the absence of the ability to do that, let's say you've got you know, three weeks, two weeks uh, before your new queen comes in, problem solved. Because what you can do then is you just split the colony, split the resources, put two or three frames of brood into your nucleus box, leave the rest behind, and it doesn't matter, you know, how many of your workers go back to the original hive and how many are remaining in the nucleus box, because if you've got cap root in there, they're going to be emerging and taking care of everything also. Because what you're going to see in a very short amount of time is one of those colonies will not have eggs in it. So it, it really goes back to, though, please learn to spot your queen. And once you find her, mark her so she's easier to find later because you want to move the queen out of there. But uh, in the absence of being able to spot the queen, now you know which of these hives has them, has her in it. Hopefully, if you moved her and she's in the nucleus hive that you just started out and the rest are now queenless, great. And I say two weeks because you don't want to go three weeks without the queen. And so then uh, you'll see which ones don't have eggs and brood production, and that's the one that your new queen will go into. Problem solved. But please learn to spot your queen. Bring in your best queen spotter from your, um, from your bee club. There's a book, by the way, by Hillary Kearney. It's called Queen Spotting. It's a lot of fun for kids, great photography. For those of you who are listening, I highly recommend Hillary Kearney's book, Queen Spotting. It has really great photography, foldouts. If you've got kids, as I do, I mean, I have regular kids, they're all grown up, but I have grandkids. You break out the Queen Spotting book, you know what little boys like? I can't speak for the little girls. The little boys like competition. Spot a queen on this page in less than a minute. Go. And it's a lot of fun because little kids are really good at spotting queens. It is amazing. Once they see one, they can't stop seeing them. Even the ones that are partially covered by another bee, they see that big thorax, they see that extended abdomen going well beyond the length of the uh, 
the wings, of course, on the bee. So Queen Spawning. Just thought of that. Great book. I get nothing for telling you about it. But uh, lots of photography. And then maybe we'll help out. Question number four. Let's see now. This comes from Jeffrey, Torrington, Connecticut. You talked about using a queen excluder cage and drone comb to attract varroa mites. Do you think you could collect the cages with the drones in them and put them in a spare deep box, do an OA vape treatment and count the drop to get a feel for the colony health and to help decide on future treatment instead of a mite wash? Okay, so what we're talking about, if you missed it, we did interviews over the past week uh, and my last opening uh, for Friday's Q&A. So if you haven't seen that, the cover has a cage and there's my little 3D printed mite sitting on top of it. It's because we're talking about these cages that isolate queens. Isolate queens, yeah. It's designed to isolate the queen. It just happened to be also good for keeping drones in. So if you had your drone frame, which these green frames are, and look, this is not drawn out. This isn't ready. So you know what I recommend? Uh, you leave this out of the cage until, of course, they draw out all of the comb before you start doing this. And then uh, if you put your queen in here with this, so this cage, both sides, queen get, get out. And the thing I like about it, this came from Better Bee. I paid full price for it. It wouldn't have bothered me if they sent me one for free, but I paid full price. Anyway, so uh, this lets you, if you know the queen is on this frame, you can pull this out and you can put this whole thing right in a nucleus hive and not worry about the queen absconding, not worrying about the bees going away. So the question though today is, uh, once the queen's in here, the other thing is people said, well, you need, you know, the queen can only do that for so long. That's true. And this is why I say, this is new for me. I'm trying this out this year. But if this was all brooded up and the queen was through laying and everything was at the, the larvae stage, so they're open being fed, it's time to get the queen out of there. So I'd pull it up, pull the queen out, put her back in the rest of the hive and let her continue her laying and then let the nurse bees, and they will, they'll go right through these sidewalls because this is a queen excluder sidewall. Queen excluder cage, isolation cage, whatever you want to call it. And so they'll go in there and they'll continue to feed these. And the question is, now that we have them, we've got the drones in here. And if you missed it, uh, the study that was very interesting exposed the fact that uh, there are drones reproducing in Varro Destructor. I mean, there are Varro Destructor mites reproducing in drone pupa cells. And uh, so that's one thing. So we have known for years and in the past, you can pull these drone cells out. That's why they came up with them in the first place. It's part of integrated pest management. You can call your um, drones uh, while pulling away a lot of reproductive mites that are in there. But the cool part of that study was that after the drones emerge, um, the row destructor mites that are elsewhere in your hive are attracted to the physical mature drone two to three days old after it's emerged from its pupa state, right? So then they're attracted away from nurse bees onto the bodies of these young drones. And now we can pull that frame away. That's why we don't now just take away the capped drone anymore, the capped drone cells anymore. You can pull them out with the live drones on it now. Then the suggestion is put that in a box, do an oxalic acid vaporization treatment of just that box. You can probably get away with a one gram dose and then uh, see what the dead mites are on the bottom. I have a lot of other alternate methods for that. This says specifically instead of a mite wash, um, the researcher that described all of that said that they were doing a 40 drone count. So getting 40 drones one by one and looking on their abdomens to see how the destructor mites are situated, how many there are. And you can pull those off with tweezers, but my suggestion was to put that in a Tupperware container because this is more immediate. Oxalic acid vaporization takes time to settle, takes time to act, and say, takes time to kill the drones. So if we do a CO2, and somebody else wrote right away that they didn't even understand what CO2 was, so I'll explain that. CO2 is carbon dioxide, and it's what we use. Uh, you get these little canisters and these little emergency inflators with CO2 canisters that uh, 
can inflate a bicyclist's tire when they're out in the middle of nowhere and they need to inflate it fast. But I take those because they're dirt cheap. You can get them in these little canisters come in packages of 10. Just Google search that CO2 and they're the threaded ones, right? And then I take that bicycle emergency inflator top and it's got the needle on it that uh, you use to inflate basketballs and things like that. And I just poke that into a little hole in a Tupperware container that is the exact size of this frame, the whole frame. So this would lay inside of there. The Tupperware container goes around it. You close the top. You have a little hole over here in the corner that's like a 3 sixteenths in diameter. And then the opposite corner of this is another tiny hole. And I'll explain why you have that. You keep this on its side. You've got your Tupperware container. Get a bigger one if you want to do multiples of these, but CO2, we don't want to use a lot of it. So the closer you can size your uh, Tupperware or Rubbermaid, whatever the container happens to be, the closer you can size it to this exact thing, the more effective and quicker your CO2 is going to act without using a lot of CO2. But then you put your CO2 needle in the end, open it up, and then you'll be able to watch inside and you'll see when all your drones stop moving and the air is being pushed out the other side. CO2 settles low, and then the oxygen, of course, pushes up and out through the top at the other corner. So it's quick acting. Now what do you have? You've got a bunch of drones that are not dead. They're sleeping. So for those of you who don't want to kill anything, that's your opportunity now. Uh, it takes them a while. By the way, the longer you keep that going, the longer their sleep uh, episode will last. You could kill them if you keep going for a long time. Once they're out, I run it for about 20 seconds more. Really like, just so you can barely hear it. And then we open it up. We can pull the frame out. Now we can look at all the drones we want. Look at their abdomens and look for those road distractor mites and get your mite counts that way. The other thing is, it's almost too many drones to pick through all of them, but you could actually, just like the sugar shake, while they're knocked out with CO2, you can shake them and get the mites to fall off of them. Because the mites are asleep too, here's what you should know. The mites will begin crawling around again because they're going to wake up just like the drones do. Do not let them get back on the bodies of the drones. I know that's an obvious thing to say, but you have to separate those drones from your varroa destructor mites. Varroa destructor mites are blind and they act on pheromone and uh, we want to put those in another container. Great opportunity to see those things knocked out. If you don't think I'm not thinking ahead on how I'm going to photograph and get video of mites moving because I use this method to collect them, you don't understand how I work. I want to find out what's going on with that. I think it's going to work great, but you could use the oxalic acid vaporization method and treat them. But I don't know yet how long they have to be exposed for that to work. Because keep in mind, when your drones are in this containment, they're not being fed. We know that drones don't feed themselves. So the questions I've had, and I've asked several scientists that study drones, how long can they go without being fed by nurse bees? And the answers are pretty wide in scope. So my take on it is CO2 is quicker. It just puts them to sleep. We have access to the mites. We can restore the drones once the mites are off their bodies. And so you can keep your drones in your reproductive cycle. You can keep your genetics out there. Although the flip side of that is if there were so many drones that were covered in mites, they're genetically probably not great at managing mites. I don't know. So there's a lot of variables here. And uh, so I would want to release my drones that showed up to be mite free to begin with. Those are the ones we want out in reproduction. So there's a lot to learn. Nothing's conclusive here. But this uh, idea about pulling them out in that cage, setting them in a nuke box or something, and treating them with oxalic acid vaporization, uh, there have been at least 13 comments on last week's video about that very same thing. So it is an opportunity. They are phoretic. The mites are on the surface. And uh, I just don't, you know, we don't want to starve out our drones, but... Uh, See how quick it works. And then you want to find out if there are mites that remain attached to those drones and don't uh, come off, you know, don't die. But you would definitely know what the mite load is on that colony. And the other thing is I'm looking at this as the way to control mites in the, uh, the main colony of bees. If we can find that uh, they reduce the mite load 
on your nurse bees in the brood frames down to 1% of what it would be without using drones in the hive. Now, at different times of year, you won't have drones to work with, so that could be a problem. But um, it's early in the year. It's this time of year. The time is right, right now, to use this method. Because as they build up, these larger colonies are going to build frames of brood. So you might find two full frames. It's not unusual to have 20% of the population of a brood box be represented in drone cells. So they also, they have a cage that I don't have that will hold two frames. If you wanted to double up on that, you could do it. I'm only using one frame. So if there are two frames of drone brood, and one is more advanced than the other. You know, one is more covered in drone brood than the other, because usually these are on the outside frames. I would just pick the most populated one and I'd leave the other one right there because we're still gonna take out most of the drones. I don't think we're ever gonna get all of them, but we can do severe damage on these drones this way. All right, I've talked about it enough, but yes, you can do oxalicats of vaporization. I just don't know a lot about how long that takes to really work. Question number five comes from Mark, Arlington, Texas. Fred, last April, I ordered a box of Better Comb deep frames and placed most of them in my hives. The bees would not utilize any of the combs. So in the fall, I removed and stored them. I recently pulled out a few of these frames to use in swarm boxes, but upon looking closely at the cells, I could see that they sloped downward as if the comb had been installed upside down. To your knowledge, have any of your listeners had this problem with better comb? So I wrote back to Mark and I said, uh, when you got this comb from Better B, was it already in the frames by them or did you install it in the frames yourself? So Mark wrote back. This is his response. Good morning, Mr. Dunn. The comb was already installed at the factory. I do have a photo that shows a wooden dowel that I sanded down to fit snugly in a cell. Kind of a side view that shows how the cell slopes the wrong way. Otherwise, I found it difficult to portray the problem photographically. Okay, so for me, that's a problem. So for those of you who don't know what we're talking about, this is better comb. This is synthetic beeswax which your bees are supposed to use, and they do in my hives, just like any other beeswax. And you'll know because when it comes from the company, it has the Better Comb logo right on it. It's being sold by Better Bee. It's sold elsewhere in the world as Hexacell. But, uh, and I've talked about this when I did the videos showing how to put these in your wired frames, because I've done these myself. I keep these on the shelf ready to go, in the event that I need to boost a colony without them having to draw out all of their comb. And it's worker-sized comb. There's a definite up and down side to this, which you can really see when you have this out on its own before you install it, and you install it with heat, and I have a video demonstrating the whole assembly procedure. But when you look at the end of it, you should see it looking like little chevrons angled down, and the angle is roughly 13 degrees. So, Angles of all cells, if you look at a beehive and you look at the frames and you look at the comb, the comb is not level. The comb is always tilted up. So that's at a 13 degree angle. That's also why I'm not a huge fan of pulling out comb and putting it vertical and all these other directions in your hive because they have a very deliberate way of angling the cells so that nectar, for example, when it's new, sometimes they put water in the cells to add humidity to the hive and things like that. That angle is structurally valuable to the bees also because the way it's angled has a structural benefit to the bees and one cell pushes against the other and when they're full, that's why it does such a great job. If that's upside down, your bees, just as described here, are not going to touch it. If you have, that's why it's very important that this question kind of get some emphasis. Uh, if this happened for Mark, this could have happened for a lot of people that bought Better Comb from Better Bee, and uh, somebody that was putting these things together may just not have understood that it has to be right side up. Now, if you look straight at the side of this, and you're looking straight in, if you tilt it, you should be able to see that they're angled. Now, 
what um, Mark did was he had a, a dowel, but you can put a Q-tip in here, for example, and there's an angle right there. If this was in upside down, the angle of your Q-tip would be like that. If that's your angle, when the, when the frame is right side up, your better comb is installed upside down. Your bees are not likely to use it. They won't correct the angle. So I'm putting this out. If you know people that use better comb, um, that have purchased it, uh, because I understood uh, talking to the representative of uh, Better Bee, who was at the West Virginia conference, the Honey in the Hills conference, um, she said that they weren't charging more for if you bought a frame and the Better Comb separate, or if you bought a frame with Better Comb installed, that it was the same price. So, and of course, this is only based on what Marcus told me, but if there was somebody there, even for a day, that did that for a day, uh, a bunch of you might have better comb that's installed upside down. Please check it. Tell your friends to check it, especially if it's not being used. There could be a reason. Um, so, if your comb is upside down, your bees will not use it. Very important. And of course, I instructed uh, Mark to let better bee know because they need to know. They've got a renegade comb assembler in their works over there. So just in case, not good news for people that want their bees to use the comb. Question number six comes from James. Mr. Dunn, new beekeeper here, I need your opinion. I don't have a wax moth problem yet, assuming the bees don't fly at night normally. Could I put a bug light next to a hive on a timer that only comes on after dark and off an hour before dawn? I only ask because I just got my first nuke yesterday had bad thunderstorms last night, checked the hive this morning, all was well, but I noticed a wax moth already in the Easy Nuke empty box. I had left open for the rest of the bees to find their new hive. Okay, here's the good news for James. Uh, wax moths are not an issue at all. Wax moths fly around at night. You see their little glowing eyes, by the way. I have night cameras and things like that, and we can see them when they're hovering around. Wax moths are always looking for an opportunity to lay eggs in a hive. And they do that, they lay eggs in little cracks and crevices, especially where boxes come together, sometimes where the lid goes on and things like that. But if your hive is occupied with bees, almost zero problem. It's only a problem when you have a tiny cluster of bees and a huge hive with a bunch of comb that's just uh, not being tended to by your bees. But if we're talking nucleus boxes and new setups and things like that, package bee installs, even with the uh, comb and stuff that's in there. Uh, the wax moth larvae simply can't get a foothold. The bees go after them. The big problem with uh, the wax moth larvae is that uh, they start to chew up uh, foundation and comb and stuff that is uh, stored somewhere that's not where the bees can attend to it. So I think you're totally okay. I would not put up a bug zapper uh, near your beehives. And I know that they have ultraviolet lighting and things like that. Some of them have fluorescent lights that are on specific spectrums to draw in moths and things at night. And they just zap away all night long and then your chickens run out and pick up the dead um, moths and things that have fallen to the ground underneath your bug zapper. Uh, there's no reason to have that in your apiary. I think when your hives are occupied, wax moths and wax uh, worms are no problem except for your stored equipment. Question number seven, Linda from Maryland. Being a new beak, I'm not sure if I have a spicy colony or if it's inexperience. I have swarm colonies, they're feral, and I have no clue of their genetics. So I've never experienced a calm inspection. They won't bump my netting or face unless I pull frames. I think I'm pretty gentle, so what do you think? By the way, the colonies are huge. Or a lot of information was left out of this question. Are you using smoke when you approach? Are you only opening the hives when the weather's nice and sunny and when it's warm and in the afternoon when most of your foragers are out? So there are a lot of things to think about when you're opening up your hive uh, and you're new to beekeeping. But I do wanna say something that uh, had happened to me last Saturday. Remember I said that last Saturday it went from being nice and warm and awesome to 
more than a 30 degree drop, heavy winds and rains were coming in. One of my beehives, of course, blew over. Good news is, and it dropped to 39 degrees, so it was cold. And uh, so as soon as the wind happened and I was looking at my cameras, and one of my cameras gave me a motion alert, of course, and uh, that was when the hive fell over. So then I uh, just pulled on my hoodie, my winter jacket, and I put on my muck boots, and I ran out there like a superhero in the storm with all the wind and everything going on, 50 mile an hour wind gust plus whatever was registered. And uh, the hive was strapped with shipping straps because I take my own advice. If they're strapped together with a shipping strap and they fall over, the boxes don't come apart and your bees are okay. And I grabbed the hive and I pushed it up, lifting with my legs. And uh, the insulated inner cover by Bee Smart Designs slipped forward as I pushed them up. So what happened? Slips open, open that little gap right there. And uh, they weren't happy. Of course, big surprise. Unhappy bees came out. Now I slipped it right back. I held my ground. I stayed there. I put everything together. Got stung on the side of my nose, stung on my cheek, and stung right next to my eye. And uh, the following morning, my left eye was closed. So, the reason I bring this up, and it's related to this. Whether you're new or old to beekeeping, start off with protection. Always have a veil, at least. I did, you know, I ran away, I went inside, I got my full length bee suit on and got my bee gloves and went back out and took my time and aligned all the boxes, got everything all set up. And then I took a bar clamp with me and I walked around and any boxes that were even slightly misaligned, I used the bar clamp to snug them up and draw them together. And I did that throughout the whole apiary since I had to suit up anyway while my face slowly swelled up. So spicy colony, that, that's not a very good description. I'm not being super critical of Linda, but does that mean 20 bees went on your veil? Uh, two or three? Did they follow you away from your apiary a great distance? In other words, when you walk up to the hive and you're doing your inspections, you pull brood. Brood is a great way to get their attention because they don't want anybody in their brood. That is the future of the hive. Did you use smoke? What precautions did you take other than being slow and deliberate? There's a lot to be said for the way you approach the hive, how well you move things around, not dropping frames, not bumping and clank clanking things together, no sudden knocking motions that send a vibration through the hive that puts them on alert. So there are a lot of things you can get away with if you're careful and smooth and deliberate in how you manage the bees. Once you smash one bee, you know, an alarm pheromone goes out and they start defending the colony. It's what they're supposed to do. Uh, so there are too many things that we just don't know. But if you wanted to be on the absolute safest of safe side for the new beekeeper going out to inspect their colony, what's the weather doing? Clear weather not super windy, wear protection, go out when the sun is at its highest, so right around noon to 3 p.m. Bring smoke with you, wear full protection. This is all precautionary and important until you learn about your colonies, you begin to predict what the responses are going to be, do not use, just my opinion, but please don't use rawhide gloves. Don't use cow leather gloves. Bees respond to that uh, and studies about defensiveness levels in colonies deal with hanging a strip of cowhide and uh, just lightly touching it over the top of a brood area to see how many stings it picks up. So goatskin gloves over cowhide gloves. They don't care about the goatskin. The smell, we can smell rawhide, you know, right away. So all of these things, wear protection, use smoke, all of these things at the beginning until you realize what can happen, what their reaction to you is, and how comfortable and methodical you are in going through the hives. Once you get the information you need, get out of there. We also don't know what else the colony has been exposed to, if there are skunks at night, if they've been bumped into, or also maybe you're inspecting too frequently and they're getting defensive. So there are a lot of variables here. 
But uh, fail safe first and then start to relax your levels of protection as you go and as your comfort level rises. Question number eight comes from Mark, Arlington, Texas. Fred, last April, I ordered a box. Oops. Oh my gosh, that was a repeat on the better comb. I'm farther ahead than I thought. <clears throat> This is from B. Wise. Last question of the day, question number nine, which is actually number eight because number eight was actually about better comb. It was just a repeat. It says uh, from McCain, Pennsylvania. Good evening, Fred. Could you refresh my memory and others on the best height, 10 feet in parenthesis, and orientation of the entry of a swarm trap? I suspect south or southeast. Also, how would you recommend? Placing the swarm commander in the trap. Cotton ball. Sorry if you recently answered it. I'm happy to answer Bill's questions anytime. Okay. So remember, statistics. Statistics are, you know, just built up from many, many evaluations with many options to see overall what bees show a preference for. So the reason I say that is the optimum area, the distance from your apiary if your bees are what you're after. 200 to 250 yards from the apiary, statistically. How high should it be? Right around 12 feet off the ground. So 10 to 12 is fine, statistically. And then what direction should they be facing? It should get some sun and uh, should be in an easy flyway area where your foragers or your scouts are looking and where they'll find it. So usually where trees meet a clearing, and that clearing would be to the south or southeast of the trees that you're putting it in. Now I've had other people say that uh, bees won't occupy you know, a cavity if it's on a dead tree, for example. But yet there are people that put swarm traps on telephone poles and get them. Now I'm not telling you to put it on a telephone pole. I'm just saying that when they find a suitable cavity, they seem to find a suitable cavity. So it almost doesn't matter really what it's mounted to. Uh, it should not be, you know, the flyway to and from your uh, swarm trap should not be obstructed. They shouldn't have to fly around branches and things. There shouldn't be lattice work and stuff like that to hide it. And I'm not saying that they can't find it if it's that way. I'm saying statistically, they would not choose it first if they had other options. So that being said, a lot of people, um, myself included, I've had empty hive equipment right in my apiary sitting on a rack off to the side get magically occupied by a swarm of bees. So remember that statistically, those are great advantages to have to put them up 10 or 12 feet. But if you don't like climbing on a ladder, put it at eight feet. Um, I also have a hunter's uh, station, right? That I don't use for hunting. I use it for spotting things and for video work. It's a big tripod, but it sits 10 feet off the ground you can get a, a hunting station like that and put it up so without a tree and just set your, you know, your swarm traps on that. Doesn't hurt. Um, so the other thing is what to bait it with. So the second part, cotton ball, how would you recommend placing swarm commander? So I wanna talk about swarm commander, not endorsed, not affiliated. The Blythewood Bee Company uh, is owned by a veteran, a disabled veteran, by the way, and uh, that's where Swarm Commander comes from. Swarm Commander Lure it comes from that company, the Blythewood Bee Company. But this is the spray, the little squirt bottle here. It comes in other formulas, but you also get these little packets. These are little snap files that have a cotton top on them that you can snap and it goes to the end. Swarm Commander, and then you just touch it on different parts of your hive. But here's what I do to answer that question. I take uh, Q-tips, standard cotton Q-tips. I give them a little spritz until they're damp. Then I lightly touch the interior of the entrance. Lightly, don't overdo it. If you over apply Swarm Commander or you know lemongrass, whatever you happen to have that you're using, if you over apply it and it smells strong to you, you can actually drive your bees away. So sparing application. But then if you notice in the Ziploc baggie that I have here, the corners are snipped off. That's because I want these Q-tips to last a long time. The other thing is you can take one of these vials, 
which comes from, again, it's a Swarm Commander pack. I've got these in the fridge, ready to go. You snap the vial so this becomes moist, and then you take a Ziploc sandwich baggie and you just drop it in there. Again, after you've lightly touched the entrance, lightly touch the landing board. Now, where does this go inside your hive? So now, magically, the Q-tips are gone, and we just have our vial here. Because, again, you don't want to do too much of it. So the corners are off. With the vial, you could have just one corner cut. Roll that right up, and then, so let's say here's your swarm trap. Here's the entrance over here, low. And here's all your frames. You put this on your top frame in the back. Just lay it up there. And that will draw them in to explore and follow the scent and check everything out. This will last you a couple of weeks easily, and then you go back and just replenish it. So uh, check them, see what's going on. If it's high up in a tree, I also highly recommend that you put a camera next to it so that you can remotely check to see, instead of hiking all the way out there to see wherever you've put your swarm box, uh, put a camera adjacent to it, aiming right at the entrance, and you'll see if it's being scouted. You'll see if it's being defended. Sometimes scouts will occupy it, and you'll think that they've moved in because, look, there's guard bees at the entrance, but they're serving as placeholders. So until a swarm actually moves in, no reason to pull it down. Now, now that we've talked about Swarm Commander, um, I do want to let you know that if you've got old comb, especially old brood comb, that is your best attractant when you put those frames in there, you don't have to fill the whole box. So if it's a you know a five frame nuke box or something like that, uh, you can put two or three frames in it. You don't have to fill it up. And uh, get your oldest, darkest, smelliest brood frames and put those in there. And that is a really good magnet. You do not want to put resources in your swarm trap. A lot of people think, yeah, I put a whole frame of honey in there and boy, the, you know, the bees moved right in. No, it's just being robbed because there's honey in there. So we want to not develop a, a cavity that gets robbed out. No capped honey, no pollen, stuff like that. Keep that out of there. Use only comb that's been well used by the bees. Brood is best. And you can also save your scrapings. Whenever I go out and do a hive inspection and I'm scraping between the boxes or I'm scraping the backs of the frames off when I pull boxes apart, I keep that stuff in a bucket. And you can sprinkle that on the floor of the uh, swarm trap. It's another great way to put a scent out that says this has been occupied before. Bees love to move into cavities that have been previously occupied by other bees. And that's what we're doing. We're replicating that smell when we're putting all the old comb and stuff in there. So those are good tips. That's a great question and it's timely for this time of year. So if you can't get your box up that high or you feel that's not safe for you, then set it a little lower. And uh, if, you, if you don't have access to land that's exactly you know 200 meters or 200 yards from your property, from where your apiary is, then set it up a little closer. Uh, the bees are, even though that would be an optimum location, the bees are going to move into what they find. So hopefully it's not your neighbor's soffit. So we want to keep them out of that. That was the last question for today. So now we're in the fluff section. Oh yeah, I wanted to talk about something that was important. The cover picture for today. Is this bee buffet, it's called. I talked about this. I met with these people at the Hive Life Conference down in Sevierville, Tennessee. And I was really excited to see them because I like this bee buffet design. If you look at it, it has this oval hole that matches the hole on most standard inner covers on beehives. I am not historically a fan of putting a jar of syrup inside a hive on that inner cover. And I've explained this before, but I'm going to explain it again because it ties into uh, there's, there's an issue with this that I've noticed and I also want to share what the benefits are. So inverted jars like this inside your beehive on the inner cover this time of year when a lot of people are trying to get things built up. Um, usually there's just a screen at the bottom and this sits over the hole and your bees can come up and feed, right? Now it's not a problem while this thing is absolutely full because right now we get really cold nights and we're going to see some dramatic temperature rises as the day gets started. 
So your bees, of course, come up and feed under here, and then bubbles of air go up and it gradually replaces, but there's enough surface tension and there's enough vacuum in here to hold your syrup, usually it's sugar water, in this jar. I did these tests last year because I wanted to know exactly how much of that liquid comes out if we're at, let's say, half full on one of these quart mason jars. Now all of the space up here is air. We all know that when the air is cold, it occupies a certain amount of space inside this closed cavity, right? We heat up that air, morning sun comes, the day gets started, air expands, and what happens? It creates a positive pressure inside this jar and it pushes out the sugar syrup below. People often think their bees are really taking that sugar syrup in. Well, you're force feeding the bees because as it expands and pushes out during that warming period, when it pushes out that syrup, your bees better get about consuming it. Otherwise, it's going to drizzle down over the top of your bees. What happens? It's going to start plugging their spiracles and it's going to start killing off some of your brood potentially. So that's why I'm just explaining why I've not been a fan of inverted jars inside your hive on the top. And of course that is amplified when you get down to you know 25% full. Now we have all this space of air so that dynamic is enhanced when you have more air space, more pressure, more gets pushed out. And so I set these jars side by side and they drain themselves just through expansion and contraction of air in the jar. That's my explanation for why I don't like using it. Now let's fast forward. This is called a bee buffet, and this is a special lid that goes with the bee buffet jars. So they come with two size lids. There is the small mouth mason jar lid. And the key part here is they've got this plastic insert here that has this, it looks like it's roughly a half inch diameter. I didn't measure the hole, but this is a fantastic feeder system inside your hive if you want to invert the jar. So this is the only one that accommodates that extra syrup that pushes out during that thermal change. And the reason is when you look at the bottom here, this has two different ring accommodations for small mouth and large mouth mason jar lids. So here's the small one. When that sits in here, it sits in the middle there and it sits low enough. So what I'm saying is it does not, uh, it lets the water, the syrup run out into this trough area, but there's enough freeboard here. So in other words, the, the bees come up over the top of this, this is textured. So the bees come over the top, they feed here, they cannot access because inside the hive on this inner cover, there's a cover that goes with this. So with this cover in place in the small mouth mason jar, even when you take the jar out, the bees do not have access to this area, right? And so, and so inside they have access here. This prevents your bees from going up into the larger area of your feeder shim. But what I'm trying to explain here is that uh, when this is here in place, the liquid fills up, but this little island stands above the liquid. So when morning comes and the air gets positive pressure in it and it pushes some of the syrup down, it flows out into this, but it does not overflow and go into the hive. So having a reservoir like this saves you from the problems that come from just having a jar upside down on your inner cover when this jar has a big air pocket in it and we go from very cold at night to very warm during the day. You can feed, I know this is going to sound muddy here, you can feed with your screen or with the holes in the jar lid upside down if you live in the south somewhere or you're living at a, or you're using it at a time of year when there isn't this dramatic change in temperature. It's that dramatic change in temperature that causes this to happen. So if you're in Mississippi or Alabama or Georgia or Tennessee or wherever you are where you're not getting these really cold nights and really warm days, that is not an issue. So this is an issue for northern beekeepers. So that's a benefit of having a trough like this. But I did notice because I test this stuff, I don't just put the word out that I like something, I have to evaluate it myself. So I did come across a potential problem. 
If you leave the lid off, you can use this for open feed at a feeding station, for water or for syrup, whatever you want to give them. If you use the small mouth mason jar and you put that here on top, there's a little space that I hope that you can see the diametrical clearance of this lid right here. When the syrup is gone, the bees can get through this little opening here and they got in, they came up through the hole and there were a bunch of bees trapped inside the small mouth mason jar. So the reason it's important and why I wanted to talk about it in today's Q and A, because I just figured this out. They also gave me the large mouth mason jar lid, which is a good thing for open feeding anyway, because now you can use uh, half gallon jars, for example. Some mason jars can even be, I don't know if they come in a gallon, but half gallon. If you put these on here, now that diametrical clearance on that lid is eliminated and there is no opportunity, even with the cover off, no opportunity for bees to get under the lid and up inside the jar so you'll have no bee losses. So the point I wanna make with the bee buffet feeder inside the hive with the cover on. So if it's like this and you're using it to feed inside the hive on top of your inner cover, no problems with the large or small mouth mason jars. If you're open feeding without the lid, please only use the large mouth mason jars inverted on this for this open trough if you want to keep the bees from getting underneath and potentially getting up inside the jar with uh, an inability to escape the jar. So I also shared that information with the, uh, the owners of the company. They're very responsive. And uh, so I asked if they would please just recommend that people not open feed with a small mouth mason jar. And they're gonna revisit, I guess, their mold design to see if they can uh, fix that issue. I wanted you to know about it because I don't want you to go out there when you're open feeding with it and find a bunch of dead bees in it. Next, uh, be ready to super your beehives. Not new, have your supers ready because you're gonna hit a time of rapid expansion coming up soon. And uh, if you don't have them already, I highly recommend that you consider getting nucleus hives. The wooden ones are my favorite because they're gonna last a long time. Um, other companies make them. Apame makes a seven frame nucleus hive that's very well built. Uh, there are insulated hives by Lyson and other companies as well. But have some kind of uh, nucleus hive so that when you're doing splits or if you're trying to pull out the queen because they're making queen cells, for example, and you just don't know what to do, so you want to pull the frame with your queen and get her out of there uh, so that they don't swarm on you, then you have a nucleus hive that you can put there, the queen with some brood as an insurance policy. Then once a swarm happens, or if a swarm happens at all, or if they requeen and they fail to requeen, you've got the old queen right over here. You can pull her out, put her frames right back in the original colony, and then uh, you're back in business. So nucleus resource hives are a fantastic uh, thing to have. I've only been doing that for a few years, even though I've been beekeeping for a long time. I was late to the party with nucleus resource hives. And now uh, I'm increasing the number of resource hives I'm gonna be using. So this is the time of year to have them. And uh, that's because if you wanna pull your queen, you came across a bunch of queen cells that are getting ready to swarm, then uh, if you can pull your queen out at that point, you can offset uh, the risk of losing your great queen that you've had all this time by putting in her nucleus resource hive and saving her for later. And if they do requeen successfully, yeah, you've got another colony of bees there for a bee friend if you want to sell them or give them away, or uh, if you want to actually just continue to build another colony, all the options are there. But it's a great way to avoid losing a great queen. And uh, that's it. So I want to thank you for being here today. I hope you learned a thing or two. If you'd like to comment on any of the topics we talked about today, please do that down in the video description. And if you were one of the people that posted one of the questions that uh, required a follow-up, I would love to hear what the follow-up was. What did Better Be say about the frames that you had? Um, how did it go when you moved your hives to the, you know, to the pollination source there with your orchard or wherever that was? So always provide updates. It's great to get follow-ups to know how things went. So I want to thank you for spending your time with me here, and I hope that you're ahead of things as uh, spring really arrives here in the northern United States. Thanks for watching. Have a great weekend.